us. Um, I, I uh, want to give you a sort of an overview of what we think is a increasing tendency in healthcare, uh, namely consumerism uh, among our patients and, and uh, those who take care of them. Um, and what I'd like to do is give you a, give you a glimpse of kind of where, we're, where we think we're headed, and I know that this is of great interest to those of us who take care of patients or advise them. So, um, so let's go through this. Um, I'm going to cover a, fairly quickly a number of different topics. Um, first of all, uh, do consumers understand healthcare quality? Because that's what a lot of what's been uh, publicized, and, and how are they making judgments based on that, if at all? How I'm are, sorry to interrupt you. Would you like to put it into a slideshow mode? That might be a little bit better I'm for sorry, our viewers. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for reminding me of that. There we go. How's that? Is that good? Yeah, that's, that's great. Sorry about that. All right. That's a little better. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so what, is, what do consumers understand about healthcare quality? Um, how do consumers look at healthcare costs, if at all? What do consumers really want now, as you'll see with a lot of the pressures they're getting from the economic issues, and will they will they start to force some changes, which uh, interestingly enough, if you follow these in the newspaper, are already happening. So I'm going to just cover those topics uh, in general, and we'll come down to some uh, interesting uh, suggestions at the end. So our first topic is about quality. There's been a lot going on in quality. These are organizations that I'm sure are familiar to most of you. <clears throat> these are uh, whether it's the National Quality Forum, the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the government through AHRQ, NCQA, the Joint Commission, and the big report that happened in the early 2000s about to err as human pointed out that uh, healthcare is actually quite unsafe and uh, that we ought to be improving it, which we are, as you'll see in just a second, but the consumers ought to pay attention to that in terms of their healthcare choices um, as well. So how well have we done in terms of these quality initiatives? Actually, not very well. Uh, the HRQ report, that's a federal agency in 2011, shows there was some improvement in acute myocardial infarction intervention, which is good, but only a slight improvement in routine screening for healthcare issues, and actually very little progress in lifestyle modification. So kind of a maybe a C plus B minus in that regard. The hospital safety was addressed with the IHI, the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, 100,000 Lives campaign, which did show some some good progress in that, but that has not really spread as far as we would like to go. So again, that's probably a good thing, but not as viral as we like to have been. And then checklists and bundles you've heard about um, to basically uh, use these instruments, particularly the checklist, to be sure things are being done right every way, very similar to what they do in the aviation industry, and that's that's helped. Um, so. Let's look at a minute what you can do with this. This is actually our, our progress in for a health system, that's HFHS, where we looked at harm events and hospital mortality rates. This is a busy slide. I don't want to show everything here, but you can see there are a lot of different things you can do. Uh, controlling insulin, uh, doing a sepsis protocol. This is all in the hospital, by the way. Uh, taking infection control down to a, a and, and making tremendous progress in this. And you can get quite improvement in our overall hospital uh, mortality and also uh, events that relate to hospital mortality if you do a lot of different things. Now, this has been in the press, but largely people, <clears throat> the average consumer doesn't follow this or understand it. This is something that the industry should be doing and is doing and, and has been working. But that's not what consumers are necessarily seeing, as we'll see in a second. But healthcare, having said all this, is not particularly highly reliable compared to other things that we see. Uh, high reliable organizations rarely have accidents. The airline industry is quite safe, um, has really made tremendous improvements. Nuclear power plants, except when there are uh, tsunamis, almost never fail. And yet, when we look at the hospital statistics, there are almost 100,000 deaths from hospital acquired infections alone every year in the United States, which is an incredible number. Um, 600 operating room fires a year, and wrong side of surgery in this country happens 50 times a week. Now, these are big numbers, but they're spread over 4,000 institutions. So the average patient doesn't see that. In fact, probably considers that their local hospital is pretty safe. But if you compare it to what happens in the airline industry and other high-performance industries, this is actually a pretty bad record. So we haven't done a great job in that. And, and yet patients still feel that their hospitals are generally safe. So there has been a, a tendency to use 
public reporting about these things um, to have consumers make healthier decisions. So the question is, do they actually use these public reports about safety and quality and so on to make decisions? And, the, and the, this is a report that came from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And the answer is, as you can see here, consumers who actually look at this information at best use it maybe 15% of the time to make a decision. So these, these reports are not things that people are using very vigorously to make healthcare decisions. This report ends in 2008 because the Kaiser Foundation got sick of seeing this because they basically had the same information every single time. Very few people are using these to make the, these, these data, these publicly reported data to make healthcare decisions, which seemed kind of strange. So that raised the issue as to whether we're actually giving people information they can understand and use every day. And that actually makes the question, what do consumers really want? Well, consumers actually have a lot of information coming at them. Um, you're all well aware of these. Consumer Reports is, has gotten into healthcare pretty, pretty deeply now. It's a very good place to buy a car. Uh, that didn't used to be the case, but they have tremendous information about these kinds of uh, transactions. Healthcare is more complicated, but they do a pretty good job of that. Consumers do look at consumer reports. The other uh, part that people look at is U.S. News and World Report, best hospitals, and so on. Um, that that gets some play. Uh, it's pretty complicated to understand some of this information, so we're not quite sure how patients make a decision that way. And then Hospital Compare is a is a public website where you can actually look at your hospital, and we'll, I'll show you that in just a second and see what its results are. <clears throat> Do people use that? And that's a pretty pretty powerful instrument to see what the quality is, to see what your local hospital can do. So that's where consumers can find this information. The question is, is it very useful to them? So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a, a example here of how you might use this type of information. Uh, I call this hospital compare, is this Lake Wobegon where everybody's above average? And I'm going to use the example in, in, in Boston where, where uh, Elizabeth and I both live. On the south shore of Boston, which is about 20 to 30 miles south of downtown, uh, I'm going to compare three hospitals. One is Mass General, uh, which is a large uh, urban academic medical center downtown, very famous and very good. South Shore Hospital, a mid-sized hospital that's in a town that's about 20 miles south of Mass General and there's an affiliation with Mass General, and a smaller hospital in Plymouth, home of Plymouth Rock, which is quite small and is affiliated with another organization. So very big high-tech, medium-sized suburban hospital in the middle and a small hospital in, the, in a small town uh, in, uh, in the Jordan Hospital. So let's look at those hospitals. What we're going to look at is, is congestive heart failure, and that is a um, uh, oops, excuse me, very common common disorder, and so we're going to look at the Mass General, that's MGH, South Shore Hospital, SSH, Jordan Hospital, and then the national average. So I'm going to ask you, ask the question, how these hospitals compare one to the other in this, in this particular outcome, which is percent of patients uh, who, uh, who, uh, were, um, who had congestive heart failure who died within 30 days of admission. So uh, readmission, I'm sorry, the mortality here and readmissions here. So these are two standard metrics that are used as surrogates for quality by the federal government. So what stands out in orange is the Jordan Hospital. Their readmissions are slightly higher than the rest, but you can see all of them have roughly the same mortality, the 30-day mortality rate, and all of them have roughly the same readmission rate. This orange number means it's statistically significant, but to the average person, these all look about the same. So how would you make a choice of that? The answer is those numbers don't, don't necessarily resonate with people as to showing a difference. Now if you look at Boston versus Detroit where I used to work, we're going to look at the same thing. And Mass General and so on, these are, the, these are the Massachusetts hospitals. This is Henry Ford Hospital where I used to be and Beaumont Hospital, which is a suburban hospital there that does a lot of cardiac work. You can see that these two hospitals, Jordan and Henry Ford, have slightly higher admission rates than, than the rest and certainly higher than the national average. But these two Detroit hospitals have a lower and statistically significantly lower mortality compared to the others. Now, does that mean you move to Detroit to get your cardiac care? No, that would be silly. And so people are looking at these numbers and say, you know, these don't jump out at me as being significant one way or the other. If this were this number were twice uh, twice the difference of that, that might impress me. But they're close enough, and so 
would I even pay attention to that? So this is why consumers look at healthcare a little differently than we might think. They look at healthcare quality, and if you look at aviation, when you're sitting in a plane, you're, you usually aren't thinking about a plane crash. You're thinking about whether the seat's comfortable, whether you can use your computer, and whether your baggage is going to get there with you, and you're going to arrive on time, because this is a very safe, safe organization or a very safe delivery system. People don't worry about that anymore. The question is, do they worry about health care? And that's what we're going to talk about next. What do patients worry about? Well, first of all, in the big picture, we're all worried about price and cost and so on. That's been the problem with our economy. And I'm, this is a busy slide. I'm going to just dance lightly through this. You'll have, you'll have the references if you'd like to look at them. But it is true that the per capita health expenditures over the last few years, the last part of the last of this past decade and the early part of this one, have shown a decline in the growth of health care costs. So not that health care costs aren't high, not that they're not growing, they're just flattening out in terms of their growth. So the escalation of health care costs have kind of gone down uh, for reasons that aren't clear. Some think people think this is a recession effect and so on. Um, I'm going to skip through this in the interest of time, but there's a lot of, a lot of the reasons that the healthcare growth uh, went up in the first place was a lot of technology was built in in the late 80s and early, early uh, late 90s and early part of uh, this past decade. That's come down quite a bit as a result of that. That's one of the issues. So the decline has become, become one one time cuts, recession, uh, recession cuts to federal uh, payment. Uh, the drug benefits have, have uh, come down to really uh, shift from blockbusters to generics and shift to outpatient in general for health care. But this is the point I wanted to make. 30% of insured patients have deductibles as part of their health plan of over $1,000, and that's actually going up fairly rapidly. The Obamacare does actually acknowledge that this can happen and actually allows it, uh, uh, this to happen. Uh, Copays have gone up. Meanwhile, median income for the average person has gone down 6% over a decade. And office visits and procedures have fallen off in the last part of the last decade. Uh, so something's going on. And what we think is that consumers are feeling this bite and are starting to vote with their feet, that they're going to start looking at prices and looking at value. And this is important because even people who have insured insurance this is public insurance or private insurance, as you can see here, versus the uninsured shown here, they still have problems with their medical bills. So you can have insurance, but insurance that bites your own personal pocketbook can be a disaster. And more and more of insurance is being structured that way, so the patient has more out-of-pocket costs. Uh, employers can't afford the costs anymore, so they're pushing it a lot to the consumer. So you may have been seeing that in your own practices, that people are having a lot of trouble uh, figuring this all out. The cost issue has now come to the press and made front page news. Um, Peter Hubel, who is a physician in North Carolina, talked about the fact that the cost of care is actually a, a health risk because if, if the cost destroys your family income or your family piggy bank, uh, it leaves you vulnerable for other things. And this particular slide was taken showing a simple dermatologic procedure that turned into about a $5,000 bill for a patient who arguably didn't even need to have it. So uh, patients are getting a lot of, lot of information coming through the press right now about how expensive health care is. So to patients, in my view, patients' health care is an alien environment. Uh, prices are outrageous and incomprehensible. If you've ever gotten a bill, uh, even I, I understand this pretty well. I ran a large practice. Even I can't figure out the bills sometimes. Uh, it's hard to access the system and get and, and get personal information out uh, often in many cases. Uh, retail industries, um, very other consumer industries people are used to shopping for and so on are much better compared to healthcare. Healthcare is pretty pretty woeful regard to in comparison to service industries and retail industries that people see. And care is uneven and sometimes dangerous. We know that, that that's true. And yet despite all these negative things, most hospitals and docs, in most people's opinion, are okay. They don't think they're really bad. They don't think they're particularly dangerous. Uh, they're okay. So what are patients actually looking for? What do they want and really need? So the question is, how do patients make healthcare decisions? 
Well, it turns out the literature is not very, very robust on this, but it turns out that patients are now, we think, moving more toward a price consideration uh, as opposed to some other things that they might have been uh, doing before. Uh, that doesn't mean for everything, if you need to be treated for cancer, you need to, you need to decide that that's worth it at any price. But some other things like elective joint surgery, as I'll show you in a little bit later, there may be a big issue there. Convenience is very important. Most patients think the best, their favorite hospital is the one that's in their town because they know it, it's convenient, they, they, they've probably had care there or had relatives, and it's close by. So that turns out to be, if you ask people how they make decisions, that's one of the biggest ones, convenience. Word of mouth referral from a physician or a trusted person, friend or relative, is very important, very important. The ambiance and service, whether they have, you know, great food or don't, um, and so on, not as important as many people think. People would rather have uh, a, a good deal and a convenient place and a place that people know than, than service. Quality reports, this is the point I was trying to make earlier, not so much. People just aren't paying attention much to that. That was a big, big aha moment in, in people's minds over the last year. Marketing. Too much noise in the background, and wherever you are, there's always marketing among healthcare providers, and everybody claims to be the best in everything or something, and people stop paying much attention to that. So these are just some of those. Just said that uh, before. These are some of the things that uh, there's some literature around this that uh, that supports this. So price, convenience, and word of mouth extremely important. The others not so much, and the quality reports probably have missed the mark. So. It was a nice study by the Robert Johnson uh, in October where they asked consumers who shopped around with healthcare, what, what do they actually think about healthcare costs? It's very interesting because economists will think of costs as what the country's paying. Patients think of costs as what they pay for. They don't care what anybody else is paying. What do they pay for, including their insurance? So this is the out-of-pocket costs and so on. People have little understanding why these costs are rising because it's very hard to figure out. The costs are hitting the family budget and forcing some economic trade-offs. And health is, is very fragile, and this results in some fear and anger when people get sick. And also the fact that high price may be linked to where you, the hospital is located, for example, downtown, not necessarily to quality. So uh, it's a very retail uh, aspect of looking at health care, sort of what we talked about before. So if you're shopping around and looking for value in healthcare, what might you look at as a patient? So use the example, I'm gonna use the example of hip or knee surgery, which is an elective procedure, very common in this country, and one that is planned. It's not, it's usually elective, not emergent. So it is, there's a lot of pre-planning that can be done. So you might ask yourself, first of all, uh, the health status achieved. Are you gonna survive the procedure and is it gonna get you back to normal function in the case of your knee or your hip? That would be a good question to ask. So that's the immediate issue. It's gonna kill me, is it gonna make me better? Am I gonna do pretty well? And as I recover, am I, is there a price to be paid for that? Is it gonna be a very painful recovery or am I gonna get back pretty soon? Am I gonna get back to work and so on? So those are all issues around sort of the post-op uh, situation in this particular example. And then finally, a good question to ask is, well, I go through all this, how long is a good result going to last? And is it going to give me some complications in the long term uh, as well? So I may have get some short-term action out of this, but how long will it last and will it hurt me in the long term? So that's how you might look at that sort of thing. But do we discuss this with patients all the time? Not at all. This is not a standard way that people are coached to talk to patients about the Now, there's one comparison that I, I found very interesting uh, that, that I think makes this clear. Uh, this was an article um, about um, a hip replacement uh, versus a 1954 Buick. And let me just make that comparison. Back in 1954, cars were very unreliable and the prices were not clear to the consumers. That's not true now. And uh, you can get the prices online. You can buy a car online and they have usually 50,000 or three to five year guarantees on mostly everything. That wasn't the case then. You'd have to go around and get different price quotes and these cars would fall apart uh, pretty readily. Now, let's look at hip surgery. I just went through talking that we don't give guarantees necessarily. We don't give refunds. We don't do any of that sort of stuff. And you'll find that the price of these procedures will vary even within the same location. 
So this looks like a 1954 Buick used to look. No pricing, no guarantees, no assurance of reliability. So we've got a long way to go to do what the auto industry did. And this, and this, I use this example because this is kind of what automobile manufacturing uh, is, which is a process improvement process. And you can do the same thing in surgery because it's planned and so on and so forth. So we need to get there for patients to, to be able to shop in an intelligent way. So with this consumerism, I'm going to get into the end here. What will, what might patients begin to look at? as they start to see the high price of healthcare getting beyond their affordability. They may be looking for fixed price of guarantees, like I said before. They may be looking for healthcare to be like aviation. They want the retail part to look and feel things that they can see. In the case of uh, uh, the air flights, we talked about that, um, and, and safety and, and, and uh, I'm sorry, convenience and baggage arriving in time and so on. But behind the scenes, you want this to be high reliability. In case of aviation, no crashes. In the case of getting your hip replaced, no problems. And we need to work hard to make sure that that happens because that's behind the scene. And the standardization of predictable cost, quality, and reliability. I'm going to give you a final example of how this might work and has worked. Um, this is a very interesting experiment that happened out in California with a insurance company called WellPoint. Or an, an, an Anthem, I'm sorry, which is a subsidiary of WellPoint. And they had patients in two different uh, categories. This is CalPERS, which is the public employee's um, health plan, and others in other health plans. And this is really where uh, patients chose uh, their, uh, their uh, joint replacement to go, high price or low price. So the high prices uh, here are uh, showed here, here, and here the solid lines and the, the broken lines of the low price hospitals. So what they did, and you can see right here, the patients pretty much were, you know, they split down the middle as to which hospital they decided to go to. What Anthem did is said, okay, if you go to a low price hospital, your out-of-pocket costs will be minimal. If you go to a high price cost, uh, a high price hospital, you're going to have like a couple thousand dollars more cost. And we guarantee you that the hospitals will be the same in terms of location and quality. So that's not an issue. Convenience and quality is not an issue. It's on price alone. So when they did that, this intervention here, you can see that uh, low price hospitals were chosen much more frequently than the higher price hospitals. And what also happened is that the, uh, the hospitals that were losing the volume, these are the high price hospitals, they lowered their prices. So competition here actually made these hospitals change the way they were pricing the surgery. If that sort of thing can happen in this experiment, it probably can happen in other examples. So patients will move them by choice, move their elective surgeries to the lower priced, high quality hospital in this particular example pretty readily. So if that's replicable, that's an important thing to notice. Um, so Will consumerism change healthcare? There are some organizations working on this to try to inform patients about things they shouldn't do. Choosing wisely is an initiative to do that. There are certain things that are, had been recommended in the past but really are not useful. Patients shouldn't seek those. Cost of care is designed to help physicians understand the cost, which they really don't. They really have very poor appreciation for that and so on. So this, the profession is trying to move in that direction. There are organizations that are going to help patients with the costs of care. Um, I won't go into some of these details, but uh, you can look these up online, WebMD, HealthTap, and so on. There are companies that are actually going to serve as agents for patients to find the prices. And some of the uh, insurance companies themselves are organizing to make price transparency very clear so that consumers are directed to more cost-effective uh, areas of health care. And finally, um, what about competition? Uh, so our final slide. A uh, health organization, a health delivery system, Nariana Healthcare in India, does very high tech, very low cost, very high quality surgery in India. And they have organized with the Ascension Health System, which is one of the biggest health systems in the country, to joint venture and put a $2 billion facility in the Cayman Islands. The idea is the expertise, of this organization with the firepower of this organization would lead to, ha to doing high-tech surgery, in this case cardiac and orthopedic surgery, offshore at the Caymans. The Caymans are not much farther than Miami, by the way, and they've already opened and they think they can drive a 
cost quality agenda that way. So if you're having elective cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, your insurance company may tell you, go there and you'll pay nothing uh, versus going somewhere else. So, and we'll pay for your vacation, the Caymans, while you're recuperating. So there are lots of things that are going on here, uh, things that um, we have to keep an eye on. I think the future is that consumers is going to be a major lever in health reform. <clears throat> Patients are going to start to look at the value that they're paying for, like they do other goods and services. Providers are going to have to belly up to, the, to, to, to that and actually start to behave that way. Uh, and the public will rely on the profession, meanwhile, to move quality and safety. And if that fails, this is what I get, like the air traffic controllers and the aviation safety. If that fails, they'll demand regulation. So we think this is a major movement. It's not the only movement, but I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of consumers get interested in and need a lot of coaching, particularly as their health care benefits change. I'll skip this slide. Um, we are interested in, uh, in helping consumers find the most useful information to make healthcare choices. So we're going to be launching the Health Web Navigator uh, sometime this summer. Um, we'd love to have those of you on the call who might be interested uh, to participate in field testing this for us and see what you think of it, test it for your patients and so on. Uh, it's free um, and it basically directs you to websites and explains the websites that we think might give some very good information about the cost of care and services and so on. Cost of Care is an organization that's a not-for-profit organization that educates providers. We're trying to push hard on the doctor side so doctors understand the cost better and also patients understand the things they don't need to pay for or shouldn't even request and so on. Uh, if you have, uh, beyond our Q&A, if you have any other questions or uh, feedback or want to chat with me at all, uh, that's my email on the bottom and I'd be happy, I answer my own email, so I'd be happy to, happy to chat with you at any time. So. Um, I'm going to wrap that up. I appreciate uh, your attention here, and I'll turn it back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so if you do have any questions at all, please type them into the questions bar in your control panel, and Mark will answer any questions that you have or that we have time for. So please go ahead and start doing that. In the meantime, just to remind you, you can contact me. Um, you'll get an email from me with uh, my contact information, Elizabeth at medimeds.org. If you do want a copy of the slides or have any questions about needy meds, um, you can also contact Mark, of course, at that email address he provided there. A recording of this webinar will be available on our webinar library page on our website, as well as in our on our YouTube page as well. So you'll be able to view, view a recording or refer someone to a recording of this webinar probably within the next few days. We'll get that up there. Um, so we will start answering questions. I also just wanted to sort of refer again to what Mark briefly mentioned, um, the new project that the website that he's working on. He, we are working with, we being Needy Meds are working with Mark on a new project. So we are excited about that. And as he mentioned, if any of you on this call are interested in testing it out, um, we'll be sending out an email to all of those of you who attended this webinar with information about how to test out that prototype um, sometime in the summer. So hopefully you'll be able to help us with that. Um, so again, please type, type, start typing in any questions, and we will answer any if you have them. There was a question about us participating in that um, prototype, and Mark, I believe you will we'll be sending out an email in the summer once it's ready to be tested. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is this is a, a prototype. This is not not uh, ready for um, you know open open website, but. Uh, with your assistance, since uh, there are many people here who are very close to, to the patients, um, we'd like to see if, if you think that what we've set up as a test as a test uh, mode prototype uh, suits the suits the uh, the service that we claim to give, and uh, any suggestions you might have for improvement. So, it'd be really helpful for us to to hear from experts in the field who are dealing with patients all the time to see whether what we provide is understandable and useful and uh, and we will, even when we do get this website up live uh, later, we will continue to have refinement from feedback from patients. But meanwhile, what we'll probably do is have a, have a website that you would enter securely, um, and uh, then you can look at it and let us know what you think. Uh, it would not take a lot of time. I'd say it would probably take uh, 10 or 15 minutes just to go through it, just the way you would if you were using it uh, uh, in a regular fashion. Right. Well, um, it doesn't look like we have too many other questions, um, so I'll give everyone another second. In the meantime, I do just want to thank um, Dr. Mark Kelly for presenting this webinar for us today. Um, it's really important for all of us here at Needy Meds 
to provide this kind of information. You know, we know people visit our website when they're dealing with various medications and healthcare costs. So um, we think it's also important for those people to be informed about the costs and kind of where they're coming from and to learn more about this issue. Um, it does look like we got a question. Just one, hold on one moment as I read through. So there's a question about um, oncology as far as an arena for consumerism um, and how this person feels that patients obviously don't often don't have a choice for treatment when a treatment is recommended and it's hard to discuss um, various options with them. So do you have any thoughts about that, Mark? So that's a very good question. Uh, it, it comes down a couple of things. Uh, one is the, the uh, among choices, how, how effective, forgetting about the cost, how effective those those particular choices may be, both in terms of longevity, cure, and, and uh, quality of life. So it's a very complicated thing. Uh, and the other part is the cost. Uh, some of these experimental protocols uh, may cost the patients very little because they are supported by the drug industry, and others may actually just be a high-priced piece. And if there's a high deductible plan, it may quickly go through your deductible. Uh, but I, I think the question is uh, how much uh, how much patient-centered discussion is there about any treatment for that matter in terms of patients can understand. And I, I find I'm a pulmonary physician by background, got a lot of experience in pulmonary critical care, a lot of experience with uh, both complex diseases, chronic diseases, and of life care. And I think uh, often we're not talking uh, on the patient's terms, and particularly in the cancer realm, um, and this applies to even physicians who, are, who have cancer themselves, uh, once they're told of the diagnosis, uh, most of us don't remember anything the doctor said after that because you're just trying to process that sort of dire situation. So um, if that's been termed shared decision making where the options are laid out and uh, I think there's, uh, uh, there's a lot more work to be done in that. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, cancer is very complicated. That's probably the best example of where this is needed the most, but it applies to most everything else. So I think there's a long way to go there. Uh, cost, cancer is one of the one of the diseases that, uh, for for good reason, and I think because a lot of emotion behind, it, a lot of patients will go for broke on that, and or think they should, and that that's often not the most uh, most effective way to approach them. It really needs to be an options they can understand, um, and trade offs that they may have to make, both in terms of their own personal interests, their family's concerns, and and their own ex their own pocketbook. So, we have a long way to go to make that. Uh, to make that a great uh, approach for the patients. Okay, so we have another question. I probably will not be able to, probably will not be able to give a black or white answer, but um, they're wondering a little bit more about healthcare reform coverage and how consumers are sort of reacting to that. Do you think that they're generally happy or unhappy with the the, the new coverage they have through healthcare reform? That's uh, <clears throat> good, another good question. Um, I think the answer is mixed. Um, the people, I'm going to give this in a, a sort of simplistic uh, form, not because it's a simple question, it's just the only way I can sort of think about it myself. People who didn't have insurance, who don't have to pay much for it, are delighted, um, obviously. <clears throat> people who have insurance already and didn't get subsidies may actually see their costs go up uh, because the act, uh, because there's payment for the uninsured, they're becoming the population, and so on. The privately insured patients, uh, particularly those with employer-based insurance, um, may be seeing some trends they don't they don't they don't like because the employers are not real happy with the escalation of costs and are I think getting out of health care as fast as they can. That was going on before the before the Affordable Care Act ever was passed. Uh, so I think the answer is it depends on who you talk to. I think the patients that are delighted with the the coverage they continue to enjoy are patients who are on Medicare. Uh, Medicare was not affected, uh, as far as the patients were concerned, by any health reform initiatives, even though the, the, the doctors in the hospitals are seeing some cuts to their, to their payments as a result of health reform. But the consumer, the average consumer hasn't seen that. So I think uh, we're going to see my, my expectation, and a lot of my, my colleagues feel the same, is that if consumers continue to see more out-of-pocket costs going up, they're going to ask what's going on, and that may push us toward a toward a more of a national type of health insurance like we have for the senior citizens. That's my own personal view. Um, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, um, the the 
Affordable Care Act was about expanding coverage. It was not about controlling costs. There are ways to control the costs that are legislated in the ACA, but they're largely an effort to pay for the costs of the uninsured, not to break the cost escalation that we've had in this country. Having said that, though, some of the things that have been that are in place right now may actually still do that latter. So, so we'll see. But the average person is not going to be able to afford health insurance if it continues, cost continues to escalate as they, as they have. Okay. I think that's about all the time we have today. Again, all of you who attended the webinar will be getting an email in a few months about our the new Health Web Navigator prototype. If you do want to help test us that test that out for us. And I do want to thank um, Dr. Mark Kelly again for being here today and giving us such an informative presentation. You can always check back to the Needy Meds webinar page for future webinars. We have our monthly webinars going over our resources, as well as these webinars that we call special topic where webinars that we hold on various um, topics we think might be interesting and helpful to our website users. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.